Yeah, we're recording. Let's open up with a word of prayer and we'll dive in. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today on a day that in seeking to follow you, we set apart called Ash Wednesday. It's a day, Lord, where we're mindful of where we've come from and mindful at the same time of where we go <laughs> apart from you. We're mindful that that's not the life you created us for. That's not the, the end that you had in mind. You don't have an ending in mind for us. You have a continual beginning. And we want to lean into that. We want to give you thanks that it's not up to us. It's thanks to you. And we want to continue to press more deeply into your word and your spirit. We want to follow Jesus more closely. And so as we enter this season of Lent, as we begin our study tonight, open our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears, Open us up completely, Lord, from anything that's in the way of hearing what you want to say, of listening to what you are doing and how you are working and moving and following where you lead. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight we're looking at 1 Samuel uh, 7 and 8, chapter 7 and 8, basically. And it really is interesting to have these two chapters back to back. And I hope you had an opportunity to participate in the Ash Wednesday service simply from the standpoint of that's really where I addressed I, the, the meditation was focused on chapter eight. If you weren't, if you didn't, you're not going to be completely lost because you have the outline that I sent you. I'm going to talk, I'll interact with that, the, that a little bit. So you're not going to be, you know, at, you know, suddenly disconnected. And, and you, if you go back and watch that message or participate in the service, it'll be amplified by what we look, look at tonight. Um, I'm going to actually work backwards. I'm going to work backwards from actually from chapter eight to chapter seven, because you know, sometimes how we go, you want it, there's good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first, the bad news or the good news? So I'm going to start with the bad news and then we'll back into the good, <laughs> into the good news. Um, I just, I, I, I think it'll make sense by the time we're done. So a couple of things I just want to focus on, assuming, again, you've read those chapters and you were able to at least hear the sermon on Sunday is just really kind of narrowing in more on something that we come across in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's a little bit of a revisit, but I think it's so important. This idea that the apple does sometimes fall far from the tree. You know, we often say it doesn't in the sense that children are like their parents. But when we come upon 1 Samuel 8, as you know, what sort of predisposes the people to ask for a king, we might say it's a good reason, we might say it's an excuse, or maybe a little bit of both, is that Samuel has gotten old as a priest, as a judge, as a prophet, and his sons are going to, he's going to make them judges. He has. And they are very much, interestingly, like Eli's sons, different, but they're basically corrupt in their leadership. And so we actually have, if you think about it, the last two judges of Israel, Eli and Samuel, both had the same problem, wayward children. They both had sons who grew up to be men who, regardless of the genuine examples set by their fathers, ended up going in an opposite direction. Uh, we talk about Eli again real quick. Eli served as a priest and a judge of Israel, you'll recall, but both his sons, Hopney and Phineas, openly abused their spiritual leadership. And in the midst of that, Eli looked the other way and even benefited from their corruption when it was taking place. And when Eli had no choice but to speak up, because it was so open, the people came to him, he tried to reason with his sons as a father, but didn't remove or rebuke Hopney God. and Phineas from their roles as priests of Israel. And the consequences of this, as we've already looked at, were devastating. Samuel served from the Lord from his childhood. He grew up to be a prophet, a priest, a high priest, and a judge of Israel. And unlike Samuel, we don't have any indication that, uh, or unlike Eli, excuse me, we have no indication that Samuel appeared to suffer from Eli's problem of apathetic and corrupt leadership. However, as I just said, when we started, when Samuel became old, like <laughs> Eli, he sought to promote his sons, Joel and Abaha, to become judges. And Something that should stand out to you is this really wasn't his purview to do. Judges and throughout the book of Judges were not, it wasn't done by heredity. It was done by the Lord raising up that judge. So Samuel just presumes that he's going to have his sons become judges. And when they do, their leadership is corrupt as they start accepting bribes to pervert the course of justice. And like Eli, the people bring this to the attention of Samuel. And I would say, and, and again, no one's perfect in the Bible, save for Jesus and for God. This is the one and perhaps only example in the scriptures of, the, of poor leadership on Samuel's part. This is where we see that he's not perfect. I mean, he comes, he's got a lot of high moments, but this is definitely a place where um, he's, he's, he struggles. And what I wanted to tease out, and I've talked about this before, but I hear this so often that I wanted to bring it up again, that in both the case of Eli and as we see it again with Samuel, 
while we're dealing with family matters in one sense, both of those stories are about poor and corrupted leadership. They are not, neither the story of Eli or Samuel, they are not cautionary tales about parenting. I, I brought this up before and I want to say it again. These are not stories that we should try to misquote Proverbs 22.6 and apply them to these stories. And if you don't remember Proverbs 22.6, it's train up a child in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. And I told you last time, and I want to hit you to hear it again, Proverbs 22.6 is not a biblical promise. It's not a promise. It's at best a statement of probability, a likelihood. Train a child in the way that he or she should go, and more than likely, that's going to, that influence will, happen, will, will take them in that direction. And to, just to, to be very blunt, to state this again, if, the, if you read Proverbs 22.6 as a promise that a child who's raised properly will not depart from those good character traits they, are, they were taught, then the dilemma I have for you is we have to say that the father of the prodigal son in that famous parable must have failed to teach his son properly. And I don't think that any of us want to suggest that because we know that in that story, the father is supposed to be God and the prodigal son is reflective of our humanity. And in that story, by the way, both his sons have problems, right? It's not just the prodigal son, it's also the elder son. I want to just, again, for those of us who are parents, and many of us are, living in a broken world, neither our love for our children nor our love for God guarantees that our children will grow up to love the Lord themselves, in fact, beyond the prodigal son parable, which is a story, you know this, the Bible gives numerous examples, besides Eli and Samuel, of faithful parents whose children grow up and choose to live apart from God, maybe even in rebellion against the Lord. And as a parent now myself, and not a parent of a, of a toddler, but as a, of a parent of children who are now emerging adults, I can confess <laughs> that we can all look back on a multitude of parenting mistakes, <laughs> I don't have enough time to tell you all of mine. No parent is perfect, save our Heavenly Father. And, and while those failures of ours do bear consequences in the lives of our children, I'm not saying they don't, they're not the reason why our children do not end up following Jesus. And all the self-imposed parental guilt in the world that we may put upon ourselves or others may put upon us doesn't change this fact, that in the end, no matter how brilliant a parent you were or flawed or a mixture of both, in the end, our children grow up and make their own choices. They make their own choices. And if our children grow rogue, if they don't follow the Lord, you can't take it personally. I know it's personal. I know it hurts, but you can't take it personal because then it's going to be more about your sense of guilt and shame where you're trying to get your children to get them into salvation or into the kingdom, and you're actually going to do more harm than good. If your children are not following the Lord, don't lose sight of the big picture. And part of that big picture that's very in line with our passages tonight is that our children, if they're not following the Lord, like anyone else, they're not rejecting us as much as they're rejecting God as their king. Samuel had that experience, right? Samuel took it personally when the people said we want a king. And God said, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as king. Our children, they make their own choices. So don't lose sight of the big picture of that, that it's not about you. And in that respect, you've got to keep the Lord. We have to keep the Lord, not our kids, in the center of our focus and our, in, the, in the center of our devotion. And that may seem strange, but remember, all of our other loves, we want to love our children, we want to love our parents, but all of our other loves are right they're healthy when they derive, when we serve them out of our love for God. When God's not in that center, then all of our other loves get messed up. Because what happens is, whether we realize it or not, we're trying to make that relationship our salvation, our Messiah. So again, we can't lose sight of the Lord. Because here's the thing. If our children go prodigal, once again, we can't lose sight of the big picture of the gospel. That's this. The gospel says that the love of God calls more powerfully to our children than anything that drives them away. The love of God is more powerful in calling our children as the same way that the love of God calls us than anything that drives them away. And so while our personal witness, how we live our lives, how we walk the, the talk, live the faith, should be, and our prayers for our children should be aimed at seeking and guiding them to make good choices, to know the Lord, to follow the Lord. Remember, our hope, is not in the choices they make. Our hope is not in the choices they make. 
Our hope is not in the choices that our children or that any of us make. Our hope is in the God who chooses our children, who chooses to come for all of us before any of us choose him. So remember that in the midst of this story. Don't let, I, if you hear a Bible study, I'm empowering you right now. If you hear a sermon, go up to that person. If they try to make this story or Eli into a Proverbs 22, 6 lesson, and please don't, don't take their head off, but say, I want to have a conversation about that. Because I, there's just so much harm that's been done in stories like these where parents are carrying guilt and shame that, yeah, we all make mistakes and, and that doesn't excuse the mistakes we make. But the end of the day, our relationship with our, our children's relationship with the Lord is affected by us. It's influenced, but it doesn't rise and fall with us. They make their own choices. God is ultimately sovereign in their lives as much as he is in ours. So. Any comments or questions on that? I know I'm kind of re -hit it, revisiting something, but I just that comes up so much. I wanted to just hit it again. Anybody want to push back or ask a question? I think that I've always sort of considered it as a promise. And I know my daughter qu quotes it so often with the heart feel that she's raised her children as have I in the faith and that they will stay with it. And no matter what, uh, you know, they can come back. And the other thing she always says is no word goes, uh, what I'm not quoting it right, uh, void. What is that? The Lord's word does not return void or empty. Yeah. And that the, the interesting thing, if you play those two verses off of each other, is I would say that the, the latter rather than the former is where I would rest because that one is about the word of the Lord when we the the thing is if there's a promise that scripture gives us is that god is sovereign we are not that god doesn't give up on us even if we give up on him and that's where i would put my focus because when you put the focus as a promise then it becomes well then i did something wrong then it's on me and at the end of the day we all would say this outside of our children if we have children we don't save anybody else right are you responsible for anyone else's salvation if you have a friend who doesn't know the Lord, is that on you that you did not save that person? No, we don't save anybody. We're witnesses. The only person who saves anyone is Jesus Christ. So if we would say that in other relationships, then certainly that has to apply to our children. We could, we could, we are, have to be a witness to them, and certainly a bad witness can have an effect. But at the end of the day, we don't save them. It's God alone who saves. And that's the interplay. And I know as parents, we hate this and other things besides salvation that our children can make choices right? Our children can choose things that we don't want them to choose. I mean, heck, let's take it out of salvation. Let's take it on something a little bit less controversial. Ha, ha, ha. You raised your children with a certain political point of view, and all of a sudden, they're aligned with the opposite political party that you believe in. And you're like, how in the world is my kid in this political party when they grew up under my wing telling them how this is the one party that's got it right? Right? If it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. So it's more of just that awareness. Anybody else want to chime in? You know, I, I want to say, you know, I have three kids and uh, two of them, my two boys have a deep faith and my daughter does not. And it has bothered me. It's good to hear your words tonight because my daughter has no faith and uh, I keep hoping and praying, but uh you know, it just it just breaks your heart. It does that oh. she doesn't. And there's no and, and and I don't want to take away that at all. It is heartbreaking. It's hard, and we should hope and we should pray. But at the end of the day, it's such that's those because it hurts because we love our children so much. Those are the places with the best of intentions. We can be very tempted to play God, to try to take responsibility for something that's not ours. And that's back to where I said before we can end up doing more harm than good. You know, it's the classic example with parents where we raise them in a Christian home and we guilt and shame them. Are you going to go to church? Are you going to come on Christmas? So are you actually going to find a church for your kids? And I don't know about you, but does anybody actually think that bears any fruit? At best, if our kids do it, they're going to do it just to get us to shut up, not because they actually have any interest in God. And more often than not, our children will tell us, stop talking to me about this. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, we're, there's a part of that that we go, yes, it's my concern for them. But if we're really honest, as much as it's our concern for them, it's also our sense of, I feel guilty. I feel like I failed as a parent. I feel like there, I did something wrong. So I want this to be redeemed. So make me look better as a parent. 
follow the Lord. And the reality is, is that's not in your control. And like I said, it's not just about this. This is the, this is the thing they don't tell you when you decide to become a parent, that there's a bunch of stuff you can't control with, you, <laughs> with, you, with, you, with your kids. You know, and if they told you that at the outset, you might think again about whether or not you want to have kids, <laughs> right? You're <No, I'm> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of kids, not that this is related, it's, uh, uh, we're talking next about this idea of Baals, Ashtoreths, and more than one way to practice idolatry. And I say that only because sometimes our kids can become idols to us, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. First, I want to just explain to you, because again, in, in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7, and I'm going to relate this back to 8 in just a moment, when the people turn back to the Lord, you know, you remember I talked about on Sunday that they basically say, we want to go, we, they confess, we, we, we need the Lord. And, and Samuel's like, yeah, that's great, but it's great you're sorry, but what I'm going to need you to do is actually release those false gods you've been worshiping. And so there's this line where they, they put away their Baals and their Ashtoreths. So real quick, Baal, you probably know this, it's a, a false god that's named in the Bible more than 70 times, more than it comes up, a, Baal comes up a lot. And Baal, I think we talked a little bit about this last week, when we talked about Dagon. Baal yes. was a Canaanite god who supposedly controlled the storms, the weather. And I talked about that on Sunday, that it's interesting, the Lord thundered against the Philistines in the midst of their worship of Baal. And the Canaanites believed that the, the, the obviously the weather had a connection to the fertility of the land, hence that's why they worshiped Baal. And one thing I just want to say, these are like little details. Whenever you see the plural form, as you do in chapter seven of the, the Baals in scripture, it's not referring to a multiplicity of gods. It's just various manifestations of that one God for the, the, the Philistines. And when we talk about the Ashtoreths, that was actually referring to a false God. We hear more, we'll hear, we'll hear more about Baal, but we will hear about the Ashtoreths again. And this was actually a goddess who was worshiped widely by the Canaanites as a goddess of love and war. And not to get too caught up in the weeds here, but in the broader mythology of the ancient Near East, Baal and Ashtoreth were seen as a supposedly divine couple who ruled together. And that's why you'll often see them together. Now, the reason why I bring up just that background, and I'm going to apply it to chapter eight, is the thing that I think that's interesting is that even though in chapter seven, Israel puts away their Baals and their Ashtoreths, the wooden and stone statues that represent these false gods, their true idolatry remains unrooted because what do we see in chapter eight? Even though they've put the Baals and the Ashtoreths away, they're still idolizing the nations that surround them, right? That's their basis for a king. We want to be like them. And that's the heart of all idolatry, if you think about it, wanting to be like everybody else, wanting to be like someone else, instead of reflecting the image of God in whom we have been created. That's the contrast. Instead of reflecting the image of God, and who we've been created, we want to worship, we want to be like some somebody or something else. And by the way, this is why, if you've ever noticed it, but not noticed it before, when God gives the Ten Commandments, his top 10 rules for life, a lot of those commandments are different, but they all relate back to idolatry, right? Think about it. Remember the Lord God alone, right? Don't worship any other gods. Don't take my name in vain. And, and that's a re reference to don't talk about me the way you these other gods are talked about. I'm not like them. And honor the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath. Why? Because the cultures that don't practice the Sabbath, they're working for those gods in order to rest. And Yahweh's different. You rest in me in order to do the work that you do. It's about idolatry. Then God goes further. Don't covet. Talks about that twice. What's coveting? Idolatry. Don't covet someone else, what someone else has. You're worshiping that. And don't steal. What's stealing about? Stealing is something to acquire it because that's going to satisfy me. That's going to fulfill me. That's going to make me happy. That's idolatry. That's basically saying, this is what makes me feel secure. This is what protects me. So again, we talk, we're going to talk about this a lot because it's such a, a, a unifying theme throughout scripture that if we were to try to sum up the human problem, one of the things we would talk, need to talk about a lot is just this problem of idolatry. And it comes up in so many insidious ways. And in that respect, I want to talk about what happens in chapter eight, which I wrote for you. Be careful what you pray for when God gives us what we want. So now I'm going to ask you, you heard the sermon on Sunday or excuse me, you heard this. Yeah, you heard the sermon on Sunday and maybe you heard tonight on Ash Wednesday's meditation. Maybe you didn't. It's still OK. But Israel in chapter eight asks for a king. What's wrong with Israel's request for a king? Somebody share some answers with me. What's wrong with it? Go ahead, Gwen. Okay, well, I had that um, they already had the best king that they could possibly have, 
And since they, they wanted a visual, somebody that they could actually see and uh, to be like everybody else, like, like it says. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? That's great. They had the best king. Is that, Regina, are you raising your hand? Yeah, <laughs> that's my hand. Uh, I was thinking that they were trying to solve their own problem instead of asking God to solve it. They came up with this idea uh, kind of replacing God, making him the human. I think you're onto something there. I'm gonna come back to that. I think that's, that's, a, that's I, I think we're, there's some layers here and I think they're teasing out some of that. That's great. This idea of wanting to kind of replace God or circumvent God, if you will, kind of back to the problem they had before of trying to put God in a box in a way, if you, if you will. Anybody else I got one to add? Yeah, Barbara. So they were supposed to already know God and trust God and, um, and here they're turning that around and they all of a sudden don't trust God. They want to trust an earthly king to protect them. And this is ironic after chapter seven, which we'll get to in a little bit. I mean, I'm again, talk about it. Chapter seven in first Samuel is probably one of the highest moments in Israel's history. And to go from that high <laughs> to this low, you know, it's kind of shocking. I tried to tease that out on in the, in the meditation today of, you know, this idea of, did you need, did you need a king when I you got rescued from Israel? Did you need, a, or from Egypt, excuse me, did you need a king when you entered into the promised land and took it over? You know, this idea of, oh, we need a king now and God kind of being like, I'm sorry, were we both just at the same thing that just happened a couple of years ago? Yeah, Carol. You're muted, Carol. It's okay. It reminds me that they thought this king was going to do all kinds of good things for them, that he was going to give them everything. And God even warned them that he was going to require, the king was going to require things of them. And so if they didn't like all of God's laws and they thought it was going to be easier to have an earthly king, maybe that they thought it would be easier to manipulate, they had a shocking time coming because God already told them in advance, he's going to take from you. He's not just going to give you, he's going to control you in ways that you don't even imagine. That's another important aspect of the problem with their request. They don't know what they're asking for. They don't know what they're going, what they're going to get. That's back to be careful what you pray for. <laughs> what you want may end up not being what you think it's going to be. And, and again, as I tried to tease out in the meditation, is I think it's the grace of God that we see again and again in Scripture. God never sets us up to fail. God always tells us, this is yeah. what's going to happen. This, this is not good for you. You're never going to find where God goes, no, nope, I decided not to tell you. God tells us, and that's the whole prophetic ministry. That's the, all the Old Testament prophets are God showing up and going, hey, guys, you're going to hit a wall. Hey, guys, this is going to not, this is going to be a train wreck. And everybody goes, yep, we know, we know, but we, we still would like you to, we still like what we want. And God just goes, okay, all right, here you go. So let me, let me clarify something, something important. It's a subtle thing, but important. So Israel requests a king. In the ancient Near East, so we're talking about not just Israel, but all the nations, it's important to understand that kingship was interwoven with religion. From Egypt to Mesopotamia, kingship was viewed as the earthly representative of the would-be God, right? Gods put kings into power. Kings were regents of a higher power. This understanding was no less true for Israel. Deuteronomy 17, uh, verses 14 through 20 among other things, makes it clear that Israel's king was to be subject to the law of God, the Torah, and thereby any king that Israel had was to represent and act out of the will of the Lord. And this expectation, by the way, is why, also in Deuteronomy 17, any king was commanded to write out that, those verses by hand, what was known as the law of the king. It was this kind of this built-in way of saying, don't you forget <laughs> who you work for don't you forget who who's who sets the rules if you will so this is important understand this properly understood the people of israel in asking for a king are not declaring that they don't want god leading them anymore no nation in the ancient near east would have presumed or wanted to go it alone without the power of a god behind them it's, it's a different world than today. Everybody believed there was some God who was in charge. You didn't want to just go without a God behind you. So when Israel's asking for a king, they're not telling God, we don't need you anymore. 
That's not what it means to be like the other nations. What Israel wants, and Rojin is kind of tapping into this a little bit, is being like the other nations, Israel wants an earthly king who can move and act in the name of Yahweh, a leader who will carry out their national agendas instead of having to wait on the initiative and action of Yahweh alone. If you think about it, this is how the period of the judges worked, right? There was no human or military leader until the Lord appointed a judge, right? So the people add the second time. This is why the second time after Samuel tells them all the reasons, like Carol said, you really don't want this. And they go, no, we want a king. I told you this in the meditation. The people add this. We, then we will be like all the other nations with a king to judge us, to go out with a king to judge us, to go out before us and fight our battles. In other words, Israel wants God's power, but doesn't want to be under God's control. Israel's not seeking first God's kingdom, something that Jesus said. Israel's not seeking first God's kingdom. Israel wants to fight their own battles with the Lord's stamp of approval. You seeing this? The people, in other words, and this is going to hit close to home, sorry for the sucker punch, the people were looking for a savior, someone who would organize them both domestically and internationally, someone who, someone who would give them a strong economy and a strong military. Sound familiar? But as the people of Israel will discover over time, as you know, there are good kings and there are bad kings, but no matter what, they're all flawed. They're not God. They're not Yahweh. It's not the same, like Carol said. And this is back to what Carol said, the irony of Israel's request, right? And I'm not, I, what I'm about to say, you may hear from a certain political party. I'm not representing any political party here right now. I'm just stating what's the, the reality of what scripture reflects. So if you hear me talking like a Democrat, you're wrong. If you hear me talking like a Republican, not a, not a chance. What you're hearing is what you're hearing. But here's the thing. The irony of Israel's request is a centralized government. That's what they want. They want a government that's centered on a king. A centralized government, what Samuel tells them, requires taxation. And it requires the procurement of the best of what the country has to offer. Because as someone once said, so stands the government, so stands the nation, right? If the government falls, the nation falls. That's what happens when you organize this way. So like Carol said, what Samuel reflects on God's behalf is whatever advantages the people of Israel perceive in being like all the other nations the costs are going to outweigh the benefits. While there is a need for governance, still today, in all the different forms, I'm not just talking about ours, while there's a need for governance, the reality is that we see here in scripture, the more we rely on the government to save us, the bigger the government gets. And the more the government doesn't work for us, but we work for the government. That's in essence what Samuel is trying to say. And that's why his prophetic warning to the people in gaining an earthly king ends with this line, telling them they're going to lose their freedom. Samuel literally says, and you yourselves will become his slaves. And the irony of this is, where did Israel start? Where did Israel start? As slaves. As slaves. That's the very thing that they cried out to the Lord to get out of. <laughs> and this is exactly where they're going to end up back into in a different way. They're going to have their own Pharaoh. Yes. My question is, since Samuel's sons were evil and they didn't want them to be leaders, wasn't it really a human thing to say, we need somebody to negotiate for us now that Samuel is gone? You know, they didn't see anybody on the horizon that could take their part. Well, and, and what I would say, Carol, I love that you brought that up because I think the bigger picture, I think, I think on the one hand, we can we can relate to that. That, oh my gosh, you know, Samuel's not getting any younger. He's not dead yet, by the way. I mean, he's going to have a lot more. Right. He's not dead yet, but he, he's, he's promoted his sons and his sons are, you know, a piece of work. They're not going to be good. But what I, how I would reframe that in terms of the big picture of Israel's history is what is Israel doing again? We don't like what we see in front of us. We don't like our present. We don't know about the future. Let's take matters into our own hands. We know what we need. We need a king. They don't go to God and say, Lord, we have a problem. What's best right now? They go, Lord, we're it's back to 1 Samuel chapter 4. We know we'll bring the ark into the battle. So they go to God and say, Lord, we want a king. And God, different than 1 Samuel 4, because God actually is given a chance to respond, tells them, this isn't what you want. <laughs> this is not what you want. And the people go, no, no, no. We know what we want. Give us a king. 
right? I mean, so in the, looking at it that way, you know, one more bit of irony, by the way, just one more, is back to what you said, Carol, what sparked Israel's request for a king in this chapter was the ongoing problem with hereditary leadership. First, they had Eli and they saw his sons. Now we've got Samuel. We've been here before. We've seen hereditary leadership. But the irony is their proposed solution to God was yet another form of hereditary leadership. Because you have a king. Who gets to be king next? The son. The son of the king, yeah. I mean, it's like, okay. So here's the big question. Why do you think the Lord granted their request and gave Israel a king? Why, why, why do you think God said, okay, Samuel, Listen to them, give them a king. Why do you do it? God often gives us what we ask for so we can find out for ourselves how wrong it is. Okay. Anyone want to add to that? Disagree? Well, I was kind of thinking the same thing, almost as a form of judgment or. Okay. Say more about a form of judgment. What do you mean by that? Well, um, not really, not, not, well, as consequences, I guess. So, yes, consequences. Yeah. No, that's, and I think that's an important clarification because we often think of judgment as God throwing down lightning bolts. Okay. And there's a biblical understanding that a lot of times God's judgment is just the consequences of your actions. And it's judgment. I mean, we oftentimes get really bent. Oh, God is a judge. Yes, he is, but God is a gracious judge. Again, back to something we talked about earlier. God doesn't just say, okay, I'm giving you a king. And then after they have a king go, well, I could have told you. He tells them beforehand, this is what's going to happen. And they still say, yeah, we want a king. And so God says, okay, don't say I didn't warn you. Don't say it's, I didn't like, you. it's like our kids. We say, don't touch the stove. It's hot, but they have to touch the stove to find out for themselves. Right. And then they turn on you and say, how could you let this happen? Yes. You had burned <laughs> I, myself. This is your fault for having this stove and making it so tempting for me that I wanted to touch it. And you look at them incredulous, like, what else could I do other than restrain you? You know, like put my arms around you from stopping to do that. Yeah, Marlon, go ahead. You're muted, Marlon. Got it. He sees it. Space bar. My temp was used to space bar and it wasn't working again. <laughs> uh, I think he knows that they're never going to give up. And so they're going to keep fighting him and fighting him with it. And he's going to lose them that way. I think he lets them have a king to show them that they didn't want a king. And then he eventually get them back through that process, opposed to not letting him have a king in the first place. I think that's very insightful. I think there's a dimension in back to parenting. Sometimes we know our children. And this is one of those situations where our children will accuse us and we will say as a parent, I made this decision because I realized if I, didn't, if I didn't provide you this opportunity, you, this was going to be continue to be a thing in front of you, right? This was going to be an obstacle to you. And certainly, I think if we look at the whole story, I mean, we, you know, part of why that's so significant, we're at this point as we start Lent, is Lent is about this whole journey to understand who our true king is. What, you know, our, just our whole understanding of power and all of that in Christ. So I think you're right. And I think it's so important because, and, and this again, pokes into sometimes the way we express our theology, that this is an example where we need to remember just because God allows something to happen doesn't mean he approves of it. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you, I said this to you a couple of weeks ago, and I know some people got bothered by it. I could tell by faces. We love that theology. It sounds so good. Well, if God opens a door, he means for us to go through it. Uh-uh. Not necessarily just because God allows a door to be open doesn't mean he's telling you that's the door you should go through. But sometimes we have this very simplistic, oh, well, God closed the door, so he doesn't want me to go through it. Well, no, maybe God didn't close the door. Maybe something else closed the door and God's telling you to knock it down. It's the Bible's God's relationship with us is more complicated than that. It's more intricate than that. Just because God allows something to happen doesn't mean he approves of it. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. If you read that carefully, I will argue that the Lord makes the provision for a king, an earthly office for a king in Israel, but he does it even back in Deuteronomy, back to Marlin's point, as a concession to human weakness. It's not his ideal for his people. If you read outside of Deuteronomy 17, everything else that God says in the Torah, what he's basically saying is, look, I'll take care of your needs. I'm your leader. Follow me. I'll be the one. And yet in the midst of that, given everything that happens in the Torah, right, the journey through the wilderness, 
the wandering and God creates a provision going, they're going to, eventually this is going to come to pass. And so he provides it, but that doesn't mean that that's his ideal. And, and I think when you look at Deuteronomy 17, even how it's phrased, it's the way it's phrased where it outlines, this is how it has to be. This is what's acceptable. This is what's not. God's not giving a blanket endorsement to Israel's desire for a king. Like a good parent, he's giving very specific parameters. This is, okay, you're going to, you're going to, if you're going to have a king sometime, this is what it's going to be like. And I would say to you, and it's something to chew on, the greatest tragedy that can ever befall us is when God allows us to have exactly what we want. Sometimes the greatest tragedy that can befall us is when God allows us to have exactly what we want. We should be thankful. And I would ask you, when's the last time you prayed a prayer of thanksgiving to God for his wisdom in telling you no? Talking about Ebenezer's, which we'll get to in a little bit, sometimes those Ebenezer's can be positive experiences. Sometimes those Ebenezer's can be go, Lord, thank you that I was just so insistent. You said no. You did not answer this prayer. That's an Ebenezer, man. Because that reminds you in the moment, not everything I want is what I need. And I need to trust God in his wisdom in that. But as you all said, in the midst of being thankful that sometimes God in his wisdom says no, we also need to recognize from a story like this one that the Lord in his same wisdom will allow us to experience his tough love. That's what I called it in, the, I think, the meditation. His tough love, getting what we want so that we can learn the way of the Lord is all that we need. Sometimes the Lord lets us get what we want so we can learn that in fact, his way is all that we need. Okay, watching the time, we're doing good. Um, something also I, I wanna point out to you that leads us back, leads us into chapter seven now. So we're kind of going to the, the better part of these two passages is something I'm, and I'm gonna come back to this next week. So really pay attention on this one. It's this, that, Israel keeps coming back to Mizpah. Mizpah is in 1 Samuel chapter 7 is the place where Samuel leads the nation in corporate repentance and worship. And this is the place, Mizpah, where at the same time, this beautiful thing in chapter 7, this beautiful picture, while the Israelites are worshiping, the Lord is thundering against the advancing Philistine army. I really tried to tease that out on Sunday, that the Lord is Israel's defender. None of the sons of Israel, back to kings, right? Part of what Samuel warns them in chapter seven is the king's going to commission your sons. He's going to need them to fight his battles. But here in chapter seven is when God is the Israel's defender, none of the sons of Israel are called onto the battlefield to risk death. The children of God worship while the Lord fights the battle for them. And this battle, if you didn't think of it, that we see in chapter seven is much like the battle long ago at the Red Sea. Do you remember it? Where the Israelites were spectators, quietly worshiping the Lord while God defended and protected them in Exodus chapter 14. When, the, when Pharaoh and his chariots and his armies were going to come upon them, they didn't lift a finger. God defended his people. Now back to Mizpah. I don't know if you caught it. No reason why you should. This is when you get really into, you really start to fixate on things. But the name Mizpah in chapter 7 occurs multiple times. It occurs in verse 5, twice in verse 6. It occurs in verse 7. Mizpah occurs in verse 11 and 12 and 16. And when you see something like that, the repetition of the location of this battle suggests that there's a significance of this place in terms of the biblical story. Now, this is, this is going to be a A-plus, gold star, Bible trivia one. I didn't prep you for this. Does anyone remember the significance of Mizpah? Why this would be a significant place? It was totally. a renewal. It's a re what, they it, came back to renew and to apologize to God and said, we will turn around. It was like second chances, and they kept getting more and more chances. Yes. Um, where I'm, what I'm going for is that, and you're, you're tracking with where I'm going, Carol, is actually, this is not the first time we've heard about Mizpah. If you go to Genesis chapter 31, get ready for it. This is really cool. Mizpah is the place where Jacob and his uncle Laban set a boundary and make a covenant to not encroach on each other's land. Do you remember Jacob and his uncle Laban, kind of the problems they had? And they kind of were going at it with each other. Mizpah is where they make peace with each other after a lot of conflict. And if you remember to mark that they've made peace with each other, Jacob and Laban build a stone pillar to mark the moment. And one of the names for that stone, and thus the name of the location, is Mizpah, or watch post. So here's the cool thing. 
much so in, in, when we're in first Samuel chapter seven, much like back in Genesis 31, God grants peace to Israel. And what's Jacob's name, by the way, Israel, Israel. this place, Mizpah. We're seeing this being played out again where peace is established. That's the big finale of chapter seven, that mm -hmm. there's peace again for the Philistines, for the, for the, the tenure of Samuel as a judge, do not pose a threat. You know, Israel gets back lands that they've lost. And in fact, what happens at Mizpah becomes in many ways, one of the pinnacles of Samuel's ministry and, and chapter seven, that's what makes so chapter eight so hard. Chapter seven highlights Israel's potential, right? This is a high point for Israel, Israel through repentance, through seeking and trusting in the Lord experiences peace, not warfare. Enjoy it, people, because as we go through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, there's not going to be a lot of peace. Israel enjoys peace, not warfare. Israel in chapter 7 of 1 Samuel receives victory out of defeat, life out of death. But as we talked about to start, tragically, and it is tragic, foolishly, none of this lasts very long. With 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel panics. And this is back to Carol's question. Israel panics before the potential loss of an aging Samuel and their perceived future under his corrupt sons. And instead of crying out to God, they cry out for a king to be like all the other nations. And those, the Lord through Samuel tries to warn them that as we talked about, this king will enslave them, take their best sons and their possessions. This does not stop them. The people cry for a king. And God grants their demand. And for the first time in this study, I'm going to give you a cliffhanger. Because when at the end of chapter 8, God grants their demand, we're looking at chapters 9 through 11 next week. I'll talk more about it at the, at that at the end. But when they cry for a king and God grants them their demand, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10, where does this lead them back to? Mizpah. But more on the significance of why we're back at Mizpah next week. So here's what I want to close with. I want to close with what for me, certainly of the two chapters is something that I really keyed in on on Sunday and, and I, I just have really been chewing on is the whole idea of here I raise my Ebenezer. This idea of Ebenezer, understanding that the significance of that, that line from that beautiful hymn of the church. Mm -hmm. In many ways, we could say that the difference between chapter seven and first Samuel and chapter eight is that by the time that Israel gets to chapter eight, they forgot their Ebenezer even though it was right in front of them. This visual <laughs> reminder was right in front of them. I mean, if you think about it, what a difference was the battle at Mizpah in chapter seven compared to the earlier battle at Ebenezer. You heard me talk about that on Sunday. I think this is a really interesting insight. At Ebenezer, that's where they had this battle in chapter four. At Ebenezer, Israel had gone out to fight the Philistines saying, hey, let's get the Ark of the Covenant and take it into battle with us. Then we can't lose. And as we've talked about, as we've looked at, that presumption, po presumptive posture and action to assume the Lord would follow them, would follow them, the Lord would follow them, resulted in one of the most catastrophic military losses in Israel's history. And then 20 years later, after retrieving the ark here in chapter 7, the Israelites engaged the Philistines in yet another significant battle at Mizpah. Only this time, Israel receives an improbable, if not miraculous, victory. For the first time, by the way, this is something to note, in chapter 7, for the first time in Israel's history in the Bible, they defeat the Philistines. This is the first time they defeat the Philistines. And all of this happens at Mizpah because Israel has finally learned to cry out to the Lord in worship and let the battle come to them to let God take the lead. I really want you to hear that. The difference between chapter four is they take the battle to the Philistines, right? We're here. They let the battle come to them and they worship and let the Lord take the lead. They don't ask God to follow them. Hey, we got the ark. We assume God you're coming with us. In chapter seven, they're letting the Lord take the lead. I, I don't know. I mean, again, I, I didn't get into this too much on Sunday, but you talk about a, 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 an act of faith. Can you imagine continuing to have a worship service when there's an army knocking outside your door coming to kill you. That's in essence what happens in seven. You know, the people are freaking out. They see it. Samuel's like, yeah, not a problem. We're just going to keep worshiping here. And God thunders against the Philistines. But before that thunder starts, you got to imagine there were some worshipers that were like, uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, uh, you really, I think we should maybe do something here. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of worship, God answers.
God, God acts. And that's why Samuel purposefully erects a monument and names the site of this memorable victory, Ebenezer. And as I told you on Sunday, this name is significant because it was the location where the Ark had been seized in Israel's early battle with the Philistines. It's not the same location, but it's the same name. It's the same name. And think about that. Prior to, prior to, this, prior to 1 Samuel chapter 7, imagine... How do you think the Israelites would have re would have reacted to the name Ebenezer prior to 1 Samuel chapter 7? It probably made them cringe, right? It probably made them sick. The same way that, say, Napoleon Bonaparte reacted to the name Waterloo. <laughs> Don't say Waterloo. Don't bring up Waterloo. For the Israelites, Ebenezer was like, oh. But now, in 1 Ch Samuel chapter 7, the sting of an earlier defeat is alleviated and becomes redeemed. And the name Ebenezer gives God rightful credit for the victory. It affirms that the Israelites' upset was the result of divine assistance rather than their human strength. More specifically, as I told you on Sunday, as the scriptures say, Ebenezer signified, as Samuel just comes right out and says, that this decisive battle, this is so important, such a pregnant phrase here, this decisive battle was reflective of Israel's journey and success thus far. What Samuel says there is he's not just talking about today. He's basically trying to make a statement. You've come this far because of the Lord. The Lord alone had allowed them to get this far, had helped them to get this far. And the lesson that was meant to be learned, to be remembered, was that it would be Yahweh alone who would make them able to reach their destiny as a people. Do you hear that? That's so important. To realize it's God who helped you get this far is so important to remember so that when you're worried about tomorrow, you can have confidence that if the Lord has brought you this far, that it's going to be, that it's going to be God alone who can get you where you need to go, where you're supposed to be. Israel was not there yet. They were not there yet. Israel had a long way to go. You know the story of Israel. But thanks be to God, this moment says they're well on their way. And the remembrance of that Ebenezer would embolden them about the certainty that the Lord would take them to their destiny, to the ultimate promised land. But not to come back to where we started. Unfortunately, all the euphoria of that victory at Ebenezer does not last long. Something interesting maybe sadly interesting, is there are no further stories in the Bible set at Ebenezer. There are no stories of later followers of Yahweh who draw inspiration from the landmark, Ebenezer. At no point from this point on is anyone ever said to look back at the Ebenezer stone. Did the Israelites ever remember their Ebenezer? Do we? Do we remember our Ebenezers? I pushed this on Sunday and I want to just give you the opportunity to reflect on this again privately, personally. Maybe talk about it with each other or with your spouse or your friend. I mean, this is a conversation that bears more to conversation. Do we remember God's graces from the past? Do we view the present? Remember Carol's question? You know, wasn't it right for them to kind of ask for a king? Because after all, Samuel was getting old and his sons didn't look like they were going to be too great. And in one sense, yeah, you could see that perspective. But here it is again. Do we view the present and anticipate the future out of a posture and mindfulness and gratitude for the Lord bringing us thus far? Or do we come out of our assessment of the present and the future? I don't know about you, but more often than not, I forget about what happened yesterday. What have you done for me lately? And I go, I'm assessing what's happening right now. And I see what's coming later. And I got to do something. I got to fix this. My last thought is to think about, oh, well, oh, huh, God took care of me before. God had this before. That's the last place I think about. And that's why it's so important. What are the spiritual markers in our faith journey with Jesus? If you are not intentional about marking those moments in your life, journaling them, art, whatever's your medium, if you don't identify those spiritual markers in your faith journey with Jesus, then you're not going to have something to remember. <laughs> We forget. We need to take time. You talk about a devotional time or a prayer time. I mean, kind of back to Gwen's question. I think a one, one missed opportunity in prayer 
we're always in prayer, always focused on the present, right? In prayer, we're always focused on what about tomorrow? How about prayer that's just focused on looking at our Ebenezer's? How about prayer that just says, Lord, I'm not going to worry about today. Jesus tells us that, right? I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm going to be spending my time just remembering. And Lord, help me remember. Are there Eben- I told you this on Sunday for me. More often than not, my Ebenezer's do not get erected in the moment. They don't even erect it in immediate hindsight. My Ebenezer's, my, and this is, again, the grace of God, is when I have forgotten, when I've tried to take the bull by the horns, when I've tried to be large and in charge, and it doesn't work out, God in that space of where I finally get down on my knees, where I open my heart and mind, God all of a sudden opens my memory. And all of a sudden, that's where I discover those Ebenezer's. And I don't know if this makes sense to you, but I have had profound experiences with God that have had less to do with dealing with the matter in the present that I was concerned about originally and more building an Ebenezer from the past. And in the building of that Ebenezer, that marker, God in the midst of that has given me the ability to go back to that picture in 1 Samuel to simply worship him and let him fight the battle that's going on. But it's all about those Ebenezers. So as we kind of bring this together, think about this this story. A name once associated with Israel's destruction, Ebenezer, now becomes a new word declaring the Lord's victory. Divine intervention in 1 Samuel chapter 7 counters costly human error and wrong and wrong in 1 Samuel chapter 4. I don't know about you, but this sounds a lot like the message of the cross and the resurrection to me. We all wear crosses. We all look to the cross. Remember, the cross was an instrument of torture. The cross was an instrument of fear and intimidation. And God turns that around to be a sign of victory. The grave, none of us like to spend time in graveyards. No one wants to think about how much time we've got left. And God turns an empty tomb into a sign of not hopelessness, but hope. And I got something else for you. I'm a big fan um, of a Christmas carol. And I mentioned this on Sunday when I hear Ebenezer. I think about Ebenezer Scrooge. And I got no answer for this. I'm just throwing this out here. Was it intentional or just a coincidence that Dickens named the central character of his story about a man who's transformed from a covetous old sinner into a repentantly generous, joyous, compassionate new creation? Is it a coincidence or was it intentional that he named him Ebenezer Scrooge? When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 4 and chapter 7, it's interesting to think about. Ebenezer was to remind the Israelites that the Lord had reversed their fortunes in the past and he could do it again. And it serves the same notice for us. The fruitfulness of our future is dependent upon our willingness to trust and rely on God. And hear what I said in that. I didn't say our future depends on it. I said our fruitfulness of experiencing our future. God's got the future. That's not on you and me. The future God is God, but our fruitfulness of experiencing that, of experiencing that resurrection life we talk about, that full and abundant life, that fruitfulness of living into our future is dependent upon our willingness to trust and rely on God. You know, we have this popular saying, right, in describe when sometimes people ask, how's it going? You know, when they are kind of asking, how's the progress of your life? How's it going? We have this expression, so far, so good, Right. So far, so good. As followers of Jesus, it should be so far, so God. So far, so God. Because that's how it is. It's not, it's, if it's good, and it is good because God's in control, it's so far, so God. So what I want to leave you with tonight, and again, we can ask, there can be some, some closing questions, but I also want to honor the time. Whenever, and I know it happens to me, so I know it happens to you. Whenever our old fears, fears of our, of our past, ghosts, if you want to call them that, whenever persistent doubts invade our minds and our hearts to convince us that we're on our own, to tell us that the Lord's not going to come through, when that happens to us, let's revisit our spiritual touchstones. Let's go back to the Ebenezers of our lives, and as we remember them, let's choose to worship rather than to fight back. Let's choose to worship rather than to fight back. And let's worship with these words. Thus far, Christ has helped me and Jesus will not let me down. Questions? Things you want to share? Things on your heart or mind as we're kind of wrapping up? 
I hope this is speaking to you where you are right now. Because this, the, the last part has really been speaking to me in the midst of my own life. Anybody want the last word before I talk about next week? <laughs> okay. If you, if you have something, you can chime in. But as we're wrapping up here next week, we're looking at three chapters. It's a lot. Trust me, I know I'm trying to write the sermon for Sunday. <laughs> um, it's 1 Samuel chapter 9 through 11. And it's basically looking at what happens next when God gives Israel a king, their first king, Saul. And some things that I'd like you to look at, to think about, a couple things. Why is someone from the tribe of Benjamin, like Saul, an unexpected choice by Yahweh for Israel's first king? And I always want to help you out here if you're like, I don't know what you're asking. Go back and read Judges chapters 19 to 21, and I, I guarantee you'll understand what I'm asking you. Remember, Judges, 1 Samuel follows after Judges, so this is pretty fresh. <laughs> That'll help you even more. Okay, what's significant? You got to kind of really kind of get into the picture there's this moment where um, Saul shows up, unbeknownst to him, to a feast that Samuel is throwing. But when you look at the details of that feast that Samuel holds for Saul, what's significant about some of those details? What are some things that are kind of symbolic, meaningful? And if again, if you look at it and you can't figure it out, that's why we're coming back, so don't worry about it. Okay, next one. Are there any clues in the story of Saul's call, anointing, and commissioning? And that's really basically these three chapters, his call, his anointing and his commissioning. Are there any clues in that story from not chapters 9 through 11? As Saul is called, anointed, and commissioned as king of Israel, are there any clues that suggest that his reign is not going to go well? That right from the outset, his reign's not going to go well. And are there any moments also that suggest that Saul might actually end up working out as the first king of Israel? Are the, so I want you to look at both sides. Some signs that go, oh, that's not a good sign. And other places where you go, hey, you know, this could work out. This could be good. Two more. Through this part of 1 Samuel, the chapters that you're looking at, 9 through 11, interestingly, the Lord never refers to Saul as king of Israel. If you go look at that, and hopefully you have a Bible that'll dig into this. If not, look at it online. He never refers to him as king of Israel. He uses another term. What is that term, and why do you think this is? Why do you think that God never refers to Saul as the king of Israel? And last one. This is into chapter 11. The first battle that Saul leads as king was as much personal as it was a strategic victory. Spoiler alert, he wins. They win. <laughs> but as much as it's a strategic victory, it's a personal thing. Why? And again, pay attention to the location of the battle, where this battle takes place, Jabesh Gilead, and what is the significance of this place in Israel's recent history. And that will give you some clues as to why this matters. Many of these things that I'm asking you that we're going to look at next week, sometimes when we have studies like this, I kind of go back over in a little bit more depth things that I talk about on Sunday. But because we're covering three chapters, pretty much everything that I'm talking about here, I'm not going to be talking about it all in the sermon. It's not going to, there's not going to be space for that. So just preparing you next week, we'll dive into some stuff that will complement and dig a little bit deeper into what you hear on Sunday. Okay. Any questions? Is this going well for everybody? Are we liking this format? Is this so? Is, is this good? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got you. I, some of you have emailed me to tell me you want my notes on a regular basis, so I'll send those to you tomorrow. If you're if you've already emailed me, I've got it. If for some reason you don't get it tomorrow, then just send it my way if I miss something. But if you haven't emailed me and you want to get on that list, you know, if there's no, no deadline for that, so just tell me. And the only other thing I would just say, sorry, is if you want my notes when you email me. Please be clear as if, you, if, if we're like, how many weeks are we into this now? If you want all my notes from the past or if you just want my notes from last week, does that make sense? I wasn't clear for some, some of you who asked last week if you just wanted them for last week or you wanted all of them. And I don't want to give you more paper or more stuff than you, <laughs> than you want, okay? Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you so much on this Thank Ash you. Wednesday. I really appreciate our time together. I'm, I'm grateful for your presence and for your participation. And I look forward to worshiping with you on Sunday and seeing you here again next week. Okay. Thanks. It was great. Thank you. Yes. God Jam bless. God bless. Oh, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.